Good morning and welcome to today's webinar on Integrity Matters. My name is Roberta Scleros and I'm the Assistant Auditor General of Financial Audit at Fargo. I'd like to commence today's session by acknowledging the Australian Aboriginal peoples as the traditional custodians of land throughout Victoria. We pay our respect to Aboriginal communities, their continuing culture, and to Elders past, present and emerging. I acknowledge the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land where we sit today, and to the various lands of those who watch in virtual attendance today. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and extend my respects to the Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander attendees present today. I'm so pleased to be joining um, you today for a conversation on why integrity matters. And this is an area that I'm deeply passionate about and what led me to Vargo as a junior accountant many years ago. Integrity is all about doing the right thing, both in what we do and how we do it. A theme that continues to generate much focus by the Victorian community of the public sector and government, and rightly so. Many of us here today work in the Victorian public sector or local government sector and therefore understand the high standard of integrity we must hold ourselves to because of the confidence the community entrusts in us to implement our roles. Today I'm joined by an exceptional panel um, to further explore the importance of integrity within the public service. I'm joined by the three heads of Victoria's integrity bodies, Andrew Greaves of Fargo, uh, Deborah Glass, Victorian uh, Ombudsman, and also Robert Redlich of the Independent Broad-Based Anti-Corruption Commission. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. I'll just go through some bios uh, this morning, just so everyone understands a little bit of the background um, of our panel members. The Honourable Robert Redlich, AMKC, was a judge of the Supreme Court of Victoria for 15 years including 11 years as a Victorian Court of Appeal judge. He was previously a member of the Victorian Bar for some 30 years and served for a period as chairman of the Victorian Bar Council. Robert's significant achievements in legal practice were recognised with his appointment as the Queen's Counsel in 1984. Welcome, Robert. Andrew Greaves is the Auditor General of Victoria Andrew um, holds a fellow of both the CPA and also the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Australia and New Zealand, two of our accounting designations. Andrew's been involved in the public sector external auditing for most of his career, starting in Canberra with the Australian National Audit Office in 1984. After this, he's held senior roles at Vargo from 2013 to 2011 as the Assistant Auditor General of Performance Audit and the Assistant Auditor General of Financial Audit. In 2011, he was appointed as the Auditor General of Queensland before returning in 2016 as, our, as Victorian Auditor General. Deborah Glass, OBE, is the Victorian Ombudsman. She's undertaken roles offshore in banking, financial regulation and police oversight. Most recently, as Deputy Chair of the Independent Police Complaints Commission of England and Wales. Deborah took up the position of the Victorian Ombudsman in 2014. In this role, she's responsible for, among many other things, investigating the actions or decisions of Victorian public organisations. She's committed to ensuring fair and reasonable public sector decision making and holds a firm belief in public sector integrity and advancing, advancing human rights. Welcome, Deborah. Welcome, Andrew. Yeah. So today we've received um, a number of questions um, from our attending audience in which I will go through shortly. But before we get into the conversation, I'd like to make a note on timing. As I'm sure you're all aware, Victoria's state election uh, is coming up this Saturday, the 26th of November. What some of you may not be aware is that Commissioner Redlick's term is coming to a close. 
We didn't want to miss the opportunity to have the heads of the three integrity bodies, IBAC, Vargo and VO, come together one more time to discuss why integrity matters. The date of this webinar has therefore been chosen not because of the upcoming state election this weekend, but simply it's because of the day our panellists' calendars aligned. Therefore, we acknowledge that the timing of our webinar during caretaker period may be a constraint on some of the conversation that we have today, and our panellists will carefully navigate through conversations, um, taking that current context into play and to answer as best as they can. All right, let's get started this morning with our first question. And I'll take our first question to Deborah. Um, how do you describe a positive integrity culture to someone new to the term, Deborah? Well, Rebecca, you mentioned that integrity is about doing the right thing. So, I mean, a positive integrity culture is one that embeds the doing of the right thing. You know, that's demonstrating working in the public interest, uh, accountability, transparency, and so on. But I mean, let me just share with you a, a what I think is a great quote that is nearly 30 years old now from the Treadway Commission. Official policies specify what management want to happen. Corporate culture determines what actually happens and which rules are obeyed, bent or ignored. And I, I, I think it's fascinating that that is actually 30 years old. So there's, there is nothing new on the face of the earth when we think about that. But what that says is how much culture starts at the top and needs to go through the organisation. So leaders and managers set the corporate culture of the organisation. It's, it's not something that is confined to the governance and risk side of an organisation. It's not, it doesn't sit, the responsibility for it doesn't sit with a single department or a, or, or a you know, sort of single bit of an agency. And it, it, it recognises that it's an ongoing process. So, I mean, just to pluck out a couple of perhaps the less controversial examples from some of my reports, and I am only going to be referring to public <coughs> reports today. Um, a few years ago, I, I, I put out a report into, um, which followed protected disclosures about uh, one of the, um, the Alpine ski resorts. And the, you know, one of my findings in, in that report was that the CEO, who had come from a, a, a private sector background, was misusing public funds uh, because he treated them as his own. I mean, he was actually treating a ski resort as his personal playground. He was travelling uh, for personal uh, reasons on the public purse. He was inviting his friends and relatives to use what was public accommodation. So you had a cultural clash there. And of course, the staff saw that as something that they were able to do, that that was okay. So, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that, that the, the importance of that culture being set. So if, if it's a negative culture, people will see that and follow suit. Another example uh, I will share, and then I'm really keen to get thoughts from, from my colleagues on this. Uh, another report I did at Ballarat Council um, a few years ago, the CEO recruited a friend and doubled her salary. Now, again, people saw that within the council, and what that created was a, a a perception, not always the reality, but certainly a perception that this kind of behaviour was okay. So it, it, it creates some poor conduct, not um, being conscious of the dangers of nepotism and mismanagement of conflicts of interest, creates the impression that certain behaviours are acceptable and fundamentally that undermines public confidence in institutions. Mm. Mm. Look, um, Andrew, you've got much thanks, experience got of this well, as well. <laughs> you know, and I'm, um, uh, warms the coppers of an auditor's heart to hear you refer to the US Treadway Commission from 1992, uh, because the Committee of Sponsoring Organisations from the US Treadway Commissions, in fact, out of that um, set of hearings developed an internal control framework, which we shorthand and called the COSO model, COSO. And of course, the COSO model um, is all about internal control in an organisation, and it's about establishing an effective and efficient organisation, compliance with laws and regulations, and reliable reporting. But one of the major elements of that, and kind of the foundational elements of the COSO model, 
um, is within what we call the control environment, which, which covers the entire organisation. And then within the control environment, the term we hear all the time is the tone at the top or the tone from above. And uh, as auditors, and I'm sure in terms of our respective roles, one of the things we're always exercised by is to try and understand that leadership, management's attitude toward internal control, their management, their attitude towards integrity. So it was good to, it was, I'm glad you started with that because I would have if you hadn't. But um, I think um, what I like to talk about when we talk about integrity, because people sometimes feel uh, that integrity and corruption, if you like, are two sides of a coin, that it's quite a binary um, consideration. Either I'm corrupt or I'm not, and therefore if I'm not, I then show integrity. Now, in my world, the absence of corruption is absolutely necessary to demonstrate integrity. But I see it actually as on a continuum. And we can talk about, and I'm sure Robert, and I don't want to steal his thunder, he'll talk about black corruption, maybe grey corruption. But there's a continuum and a spectrum, if you like. And um, I commend to you the work of um, AJ Brown from Griffith University in Transparency International Australia. And he talks about this, this um, continuum uh, on the spectrum between corruption at one end and integrity at the other end. And uh, the challenge I throw out to all public servants uh, today is that you don't demonstrate integrity simply by the absence of corruption. You demonstrate integrity <coughs> by making sure you deliver public services efficiently, effectively, economically and in compliance with the law. So it's not sufficient to simply say we didn't do the wrong thing here. You actually need to be able to say we did the right thing here. So I think that's my reflection on a positive integrity culture. Mm. Right? Well, most organisations have very clearly defined codes of conduct. Um, so there's, there's always two questions, though, in relation to codes of conduct. The first is, are they properly understood? And secondly, is the organisation ensuring that they are implemented on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, last week, um, I attended the Australian Public Sector Anti-Corruption conference. We had a very large number of delegates from around Australia and at a number of plenary sessions the same sentiment was expressed. Namely, if you want to look at organisations that have a good culture of integrity, you see that there is a freedom amongst the staff to express their views fearlessly without fear of repercussion. And that, I think, is the core. If we're looking at saying to someone, what's, what does a new, what does a, a culture of integrity mean? It means understanding the code and recognising that wherever, even starting with the small areas where things may not be done precisely as they should be, recognising that you can stand up and call those things out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, very true. All right, um, we'll move on to our next question in the interest of time mm. this morning. Um, Andrew, I'll invite you to respond to this question initially. Most of the audience today are from the Victorian public sector. From an integrity perspective, we hear much about a public servant's critical role um, of speaking truth to power. What does this term mean to you? Mm. It's an interesting um, concept. It has a fa fairly loaded concept, speaking truth to power. It obviously reflects the fact that there is a uh, power relationship um, and uh, in, in, in the context of the Victorian public sector, and maybe more broadly, and maybe um, just responding to your um, opening remarks, Roberta, about the election period. Having worked in three jurisdictions, I'll generalise my comments, and I'm not going to attribute these comments to any particular jurisdiction. Uh, it'll be my observations over um, working at the, at the federal level in Queensland and here in Victoria. So truth to power, I think the first reflection, just following on from what Robert said, if you want to get people to speak truth to power, you need to create a psychologically safe environment within which to do that. And I also attended the APSAC conference last week, and that certainly was a thematic about the psychological safety of the environment, which is such an important part of the culture. Mm -hmm. And of course, what developed from that in those conversations was where, where, where do you take that? How do you create that? And of course, there was a lot of reflection on face diversity and more broadly diversity and other attributes within an organisation. If I come back to truth to power, I, the thing that exercises 
the most in this um, equation as Auditor General is when we look at this responsibility of the public service across Australia, uh, state and federal, to provide, um, as it's sometimes characterised, frank and fearless advice. I guess the term fearless is responding to the power dynamic. I like to talk about it as full and frank advice. Um, full in the sense that where I have seen public servants fail to discharge their obligation to provide impartial uh, advice to ministers, um, a lot of it is about being what I might, what we have, what has been euphemistically expressed as being economical with the truth. In other words, what we're telling our ministers, what we're telling government is not. Um, uh, is, is honest, is truthful, but we haven't necessarily given them the whole truth. And to me, that's quite a disturbing um, approach, um, taking the attitude that what I will do is I will only um, put in the information that either serves our agenda as a public service in trying to convince a minister of the merits of our advice, or I might even second guess what I think the government wants to hear in its advice. So I might want to shape the advice um, and cherry pick so that it's um, supportive of a government agenda uh, without necessarily giving all the information that would be required and demanded if you were trying to take a balanced view of the world and come up with an informed decision. So I've seen this over three jurisdictions. Um, I am pleased that in the Victorian context that most recently the Public Service Commissioner has updated their guidelines. Uh, particularly separate guidelines for secretaries and senior executives and for others who are dealing with advising ministers. And it's always put to me, and, and one of the examples that's quite often put to me in this setting is that the government's made a decision, Andrew, so our job was to get on and implement the decision. And of course, as public servants, your job is there to implement the government's agenda. Uh, but those guidelines make it clear that while you're not there to frustrate the agenda or to second guess um, the decision or to continually contest the decision after it's made, you need to be mindful as a public service that, servant that if you haven't had, if the, if the government hasn't had the benefit of your advice before the decision, um, it's worthwhile informing them after the decision, particularly if there are um, unintended consequences or risks that weren't thought about in the context of the original decision. So I still think we've got a fair way to go in speaking truth to power in the way that we frame our advice to government. I'm not sure if the others have a view on that. Well, I think the starting point is to recognise every person who determines that they will join the public sector undertakes to discharge their duty in accordance with the public trust, namely that they will discharge their functions ensuring that what they say and do serves the public interest. Um, picking up on your point, Andrew, about um, meeting the government of the day's objectives, and these are comments that I make drawing upon not only the experience in Victoria, but at a federal level, and my fellow commissioners from around Australia, that um, what we have seen over recent decades is far too much weight being given by public servants to the obligation to assist the government in achieving its objectives. Indeed, I think it was back in 2013 that a speech was made by the head of the public service in Victoria about what the component that he added to the concept of frank and fearless advice, he added the obligation of responsiveness. That is, the public servant should be responsive to the needs of government. And that must never be allowed to override those other obligations, so as to ensure that when, no matter what level you're at within the public service, um, you are always discharging that function in accordance with your duty to the public trust to ensure that it serves the public interest. 
Well, I think much of our audience here today is aware that I've got a current live investigation into the alleged politicisation of the, the public service. And the, the, the corollary to that is, you know, is there a failure of, of, of what we describe as frank and fearless advice? So I'm very consciously not going to talk about that because it is an, an ongoing investigation. But um, you know, hold that one for 2023. I think just the one thing I, I would pick up around speaking truth to power, and, and you know, we, we've talked about a, an atmosphere in which people feel free to, to, to challenge. Uh, I, th I think I would just mention the whistleblowing regime and the importance of that in speaking truth to power, because even if you're not confident about your organisation, even if you don't think that it is um, creating the kind of environment where you can challenge management or leadership uh, about its it, its um, actions and decisions, the whistleblower regime does provide protections and anonymity for people who want to uh, come forward with um, allegations that are deserving of investigation. And I I mentioned the um, those investigations involving CEOs uh, before. Now that took some really courageous whistleblowers, and good on them who went to IVAC or came to my office and said, we're concerned about what is going on here. And that resulted in real change, including, um, I would add, the departure of those various CEOs, and you hope then the, the mm. creation of a, of a culture that, is, that will take notice mm. of these things. Mm. Thanks, Deb, but that's good advice um, for many of our attendees today. Okay. Moving on to um, question three of our pre-session, I'll um, refer this one to you, Robert, uh, initially. So recent IVAC investigations have highlighted corruption risks associated with conflicts of interest within the public sector. What are your views on failures to declare or manage conflicts and the potential impact on public trust? I think that the question you've probably had in mind, Operation Maru, which is the most recent investigation in which we published a report in which the CEO for many years had not been discharging his obligations in accordance with the principles of conflict of interest. Um, this comes back to a point I made a little earlier that um, the starting point always has got to be other codes or standards understood and strangely enough perhaps all principles there seems to be a perennial misunderstanding of exactly what is entailed by conflict of interest. It's a bit of a, a mystery to me why it should be so poorly understood. I suspect the answer in part is because it's not adequately and rigorously enforced within every organisation. So in the case of Maru, um, the conflicts of interest had gone on for 20 years. Um, in which the CEO had uh, bestowed uh, benefits on a particular company in which he had uh, uh, an interest through his partner who held a very senior position in that company. Um, I think the main area of difficulty in conflict of interest is with the concept of a perception of a conflict. Of Most people understand when there's an actual conflict but where um, they should say, no, I can't do that because a reasonable person, properly informed and looking at what I'm doing, would have concerns that maybe I won't impartially go about the discharge of my function. It's, an important, it's a really important concept, but in picking up Andrew's earlier point about um, soft corruption, it's an important area because it is often the start mm. of a problem which then, if it's not arrested, leads to something more significant. Well, if I can pick up on that, Robert, you're so right, because so many of the protected disclosures that I get to investigate go down to perceived conflicts. And if, you know, if I have one message to the public sector about managing of conflicts, it is about the importance of perception which is as real mm. in its way as, as the reality. So, you know, for example, I, I put out a report not long ago into a local council where the allegation was around the allegations of corruption between a planner and a property developer. 
And you can see where that, that came from because you know the, the planner was having Christmas lunches with the property developer, and there were you know there were things going on that weren't declared. Uh, but but so often it, it comes down to it may be incompetence, um, it may be all kinds of things that are not actually corruption, but it creates an impression that if it had been managed in the first place would not have resulted in the investigation by the ombudsman. So you know the importance of mm recognizing the perceptions in, in, in conflicts and dealing with those. I, I couldn't agree more. But I, you know, reflecting on what Robert said, I too am quite often um, mystified maybe is overstating it, but it just doesn't seem to be uppermost or foremost in people's minds. So when we did the audit reviewing you know, the emergency expenditure, we did find a number of examples where people hadn't declared um, either perceived potential or actual conflicts. And you try to get to the bottom of it, and, and, and part of it is probably this lack of awareness um, of the need to, a, a lack of an appreciation that this is actually an integrity matter. Um, so I'm trying to understand that kind of, that human dimension about why people don't even think, to think about conflicts of interest. So sure, the guidelines should be there, but um, how has it lived in the organisation? In my own organisation, we have a standing agenda item on all our senior executive and operational groups. The first item is conflicts of interest. And so we just make it a practice. It's just good housekeeping. And then that's seen throughout the entire organisation that we are positively stating that we believe we have no actual potential or perceived conflicts of interest. But, so I think more work needs to be done in that space and people need to appreciate the central importance of it. But I think the other psychological factor that could be playing in people's minds here is that they therefore perceive conflict of interest bad but really the way to manage a conflict of interest is to declare it if it is declared and open uh, and, and is known about then it can be managed within a process whether it's a recruitment process or a procurement process it doesn't matter so it, it doesn't automatically mean you know corruption it just let's just declare it and then we can manage it i don't think people appreciate that that is the way to manage conflicts of interest. I'll just pick up the point there, Andrew, that I think the concept of managing a conflict is sometimes misunderstood as meaning I can stay in the conflict stay as long as it's managed. Yes. No, managed no. meaning that you've got to remove you, the, the yeah, conflict. Exactly. You recuse yourself from the decision. Exactly right. But uh, I think the first thing is don't be afraid to declare the conflict. And, and you know? I, I think that's something we see all the time as well, that there is a perception that a conflict is a bad thing. Yeah. We all have conflicts. Yeah, you know, nobody yeah. in public or private life does not have some conflict yeah. of interest in their day-to-day -day work or life. Mm -hmm. So it's normal. Yeah. But, you know, the, it's how you deal with it exactly. that um, is what demonstrates your integrity. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We've discussed um, through some of the conversations some measures to mitigate corruption risks and to promote good governance. But when it comes to public confidence in public institutions, is it enough for public officials to simply say, trust us with the government? Uh, no, is the short answer to that question. I mean, you know, I'm not going to expand on the social contract between government and the people and democracy and so on, yeah, but the, the, the fact is that if the public sees unfair decisions, if, they, if, if there's no accountability, if there's no transparency uh, in, in decision making, then that fundamentally undermines public trust. And, and you know, so, uh, such a huge part of my job is exposing these things and saying, you know, this is how you could have done it better. So, you know, I mean, just to dust off a few recent examples, the, um, the importance of community consultation. You know, we, we looked at how the Environment Protection Authority was dealing, was making decisions in relation to, to toxic spoil from the Westgate Tunnel Project. Now, in the end, in fact, we found that their decision making itself was sound, it, it respected human rights. Where it went horribly wrong was their failure to consult and communicate. And what, what that meant was that people, I mean, people were really scared in the community about where this stuff was going to be dumped. But, and the response at the time from the EPA was, well, we're not going to engage because people are angry. 
Now, in fact, that's precisely the point where you do need to consult and you do need to engage and to confront with facts and evidence and things that they had. So, you know, so I, I put that as an example of how that undermines public confidence in our institutions by a failure to engage and consult. And we've seen other examples. I'll just pluck another out of uh, out of the air. The um, the um, the border crossings. Uh, scheme when when our when Victoria was, was was not only locked down you know quite recently but people were locked out mm. uh, and a, a key issue there was there was an exemption scheme on paper it looked very sound but when we looked at the fairness of decision making we found a lot to answer for and what you see from that are uh, where. There's no um, there's no reasons for decisions, for example. You know, no reasons are given. There's um, on the face of it, decisions seem unfair. Again, you know, these undermine public trust in in government. So there's some pretty simple, basic tools that we can derive from that. You know, be open and transparent in your decision making. Provide a a clear complaints process. Complaints are like a canary in the coal mine here. They, they actually can identify where the public is concerned before it becomes an issue that, that comes to the ombudsman. So there are, you know, there, there are some really simple techniques that public agencies can, can follow to promote public confidence in their institutions and in their decision making. And I, you know, I encourage our audience, if they're not aware of those, to read some of my reports. Um, well, I think, we, I think we have to acknowledge uh, nationwide that there is less trust in government now than there has been for a very long time. Um, and I've been saying now for some time that the explanation for that really lies in the redistribution of power within executive government. By that I mean that we look at the common phenomenon of the concentration of power around leaders. Um, we look at the increasing sphere of influence of ministerial advisors. We look at the diminution in the responsibility of individual ministers in discharging their functions. And finally, we look at the decreased role which the public service now plays in providing policy advice uh, and, and, as we touched on earlier, on the reticence to give frank, fearless, independent advice. A good example of that um, is in the saga that arose in relation to the former Prime Minister in relation to his decision to confer on himself a number of ministerial portfolios, which highlights a number of those um, pillars of the executive government all working together to produce an unsatisfactory outcome, namely concentration of power, the failure uh, or the distortion in responsibility between the leader and their ministers, and the failure of the public service to speak up and say, you can't do that. Um, that distribution of power has been shifting for the best part of four decades. My pre uh, predecessor in the New South Wales ICAC, Peter Ball, wrote in his really valuable text of two decades ago, all of those features exist. We've known about them for probably four decades, but there has been no attempt made at a national level within states or at a federal level to arrest that slide in the way in which powers exercised. And until that happens, we will see a continuing increase, I fear, in soft corruption. Mm. It's quite challenging, isn't it? I mean, you, you, you're kind of talking about, I think, Westminster conventions and how they're applied and interpreted in, in the kind of contemporary context. I don't want to really venture into that. I'm mindful in my act. I am prohibited from questioning the merits of government policy objectives, so I would not um, want to break my um, oath of office and, and start talking about that now. So I'm going to I'm going to pivot to another dimension of um, trust in government on a, on a much safer grounds uh, than where Robert was, I think. Um, 
Yeah, of course. Um, we would never say, just trust us. Um, and the corollary, I think, to this idea of full and frank advice to government is really full and frank disclosure by government of how it's performing. This has been an area for decades that all jurisdictions have struggled with. The way we report on how we perform to the public, uh, our service performance information, even our financial information, um, has, is, is after 30 years is still best summarised as a work in progress. And um, I quite often despair. I find that the, the reporting by government on its performance is obfuscatory, um, confusing, doesn't focus on the things that matter, doesn't use measures that really tell you about efficient and effective service delivery. And I think that's probably part of the reason why the public um, attitude towards government, and I can recall just as an aside, speaking to someone about this a few years ago, and, and they said, no, Andrew, you've got it wrong. You know, when people say they don't trust the government, they're talking about the, the government in power. They're not talking about the public sector, you know. They, they, they trust the public sector, but it's the, it's the executive they don't trust. I'm not sure I see that distinction when I'm talking to people in the public. Um, and if you're going to erode trust um, in the public sector, I think part of the erosion of trust is the public sector and the agencies out there putting out their information in their annual reports and talking about the performance. Um, and I think uh, there's a huge amount of work still to be done um, to build, rebuild or to build trust by openly and honestly reporting on how we're going against our plans, our, our priorities or whatever it may be. Um, Andrew, I think it's important that you mentioned the Westminster Conventions, notwithstanding your reluctance to expand on it. Um, but I think it highlights the fact that right now there's less clarity than there has been for a very long time about what the standards are that are to be applied to ministers. Too often now we hear the argument, I've got a very large department, I've got many advisors that I have to be responsible for, I can't be liable for every decision that they make. And what, there's no clarity now about when they should be liable and if indeed there is to be any modification of those principles, what that modification should be. A most unsatisfactory mm. environment in which all of us have got to work mm. if there's uncertainty about the standards. Mm. Look, yeah, all right, and just to come back there, I, and I referred earlier to the, to the updated BPSC guidelines on um, the relationship between a secretary and senior executives of the department um, and the advising, the advising role they have and those guidelines also obviously talk about the, the ministerial advisors and the relationship between the public sector and the advisors. And they do caution the public sector to make sure that they stand apart and are impartial. But one of the things that struck me in reading those updated guidelines was the idea, and I alluded to it earlier on in one of my answers, is that um, there was a reflection that not all the necessary information that should have been referred to a minister was being referred up. And I just wonder whether that was uh, a lack of um, role clarity and responsibility, you know, to what extent is the delegation and assignment of authority down into the public sector clear about um, what needs to be referred up, what doesn't need to be referred up. Um, I can recall from uh, many, many years ago in another jurisdiction, seeing a brief come back down from a minister saying, never brief me on this again. Now, the guidelines um, kindly say, well, the minister might say that to you because it's not a material matter and they don't need to be briefed on it. Or um, maybe the minister's waiting for more information. Well, clearly there's a third reason, which is I don't want this documented in the future. But so these are the challenges we face in, 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 when we are asking questions about integrity. Now, what, am I, what is my relationship with the minister? What is my relationship with the ministerial office? What type of briefings am I putting up? Am I giving full advice? So not being economical with the truth? Uh, and is it frank? Uh, so again, I think we just keep coming back to this idea. Mm -hmm. um, the role of the public sector, the public servant, and our um, need to adhere to our codes of conduct uh, when we're providing advice. And you touch on the influence of the advisor, because it's important to remember 
both historically and as things presently stand, the advisor is first and foremost a political advisor, not giving advice about whether or not the particular matters necessarily serves the public interest. And so if the advisor is able to play a too dominant role, we immediately have the risk that the power is not being exercised for the purpose for which it was intended. Sure, but that's not to um, kind of uh, invalidate the role of an advisor. We're, we're not arguing against advisors, this concept of contestable advice and that the public service is not the sole source of advice, I think is well understood and well practised around Australia. So it's not a criticism of advisors. I think the caution in the VPSC guidelines and my caution is, is that the public sector needs to re understand that there is another source of advice but they need to stand apart and they need to be impartial and independent, bring to bear their knowledge, their experience, their skill sets, and put that in their advice, not try and second guess. And, and as you say, try to not be overly influenced by the advisors. Um, try not to second guess what might need to go up to the minister. And again, that's called out in the guidelines. So I'm certainly going to be using those guidelines in future audits as I go through and look at the decision-making processes. Yeah. Thank you. Robert, your term as Commissioner is drawing to a close. Um, so we want to sort of ask you about your reflections, uh, looking at you know, what you're optimistic about, whether there's anything um, that you may change or any unfinished business um, in your reflection. Well, wow. how much time do we have? <laughs> You've got time. You've got time. <laughs> Take as much time as you need to <laughs> take. Um, look. One's got a great deal to be optimistic about with the advent of a federal anti-corruption body because uh, in Australia's federation we rightly look to the federal government to provide leadership on issues and integrity leadership is critical and I think that having a federal body that largely will replicate the functions of all of the state bodies will mean not only that there will be much greater public attention and focus on those sorts of issues, but it also provides a new form of protection for integrity agencies. I think it, it immediately becomes that much harder for a state government to then intrude into the role of the the state integrity agency. So I, I, I'm optimistic about the future, whilst at the same time um, repeating my concern that the rise of soft corruption is the inevitable result of the redistribution of power over the last four decades. Um, what would I change if I could change one thing? Um, I would remove the requirement not only in Victoria, but interstate, that provides too much focus on the, on criminal offences. Um, four decades ago, the uh, Fitzgerald Commission in Queensland said that it's a mistake to start and end integrity issues by looking at the commission of crimes. We're not talking here about the dangers of black corruption. Everybody knows when a crime is committed, money in a brown paper bag, um, fraud where there are financial gains to be obtained by the decision maker if they make a particular form of decision, soft corruption, which is the much, much greater problem, um, means that integrity agencies have to be able to lift their gaze beyond the commission of criminal activity. And if we look at recent experiences of interstate commissions, Queensland, South Australia, um, the fact that prosecutions have not necessarily gone in the way in which the integrity agency of the day hoped is no indication that those agencies were not performing useful, effective purposes. I think that there's a danger also that overly focused on the proof of crimes also raises the question, what, why aren't the police able to investigate those things? You don't need to have an elaborate integrity agency to investigate and prosecute criminal activity. So my, my hope is that over time, particularly with the advent of the Federal Commission, which is not going to be restricted to the pursuit of criminal conduct, 
that we will see around Australia much broader focus on soft corruption issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Deborah, you've been in the role <laughs> since 2014. Any reflections? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's um, we, we did get some advance notice of you know, questions, and I was thinking about what was I optimistic about, and I really actually struggled with it. I, I, I will confess to this small audience, uh, but. Um, but I, I, I did actually land on a very similar point to the one you've raised, Robert, and, and that is that I, I am optimistic about the increased public interest in integrity. And I think that's a really good thing. That I think it's a good thing that we have a whistleblower regime. I think it's a good thing that, um, that, that people are increasingly, and this is my sense, increasingly confident about coming forward when they, when they think people are doing the wrong thing, because ultimately what, as we've all been expanding, what creates a, an integrity culture is the, the, um, the, the willingness to come forward. I mean, if we simply relied on, on, on getting into people's sort of books and records, um, we, we would never get anywhere near enough to the heart of, 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 of where things go wrong. So you've, you've got to have the insiders who say, I'm not happy with this. Mm. So, so I am. I am optimistic about that. I am more optimistic about the um, the, the, the overall importance that the public now uh, places on integrity in public life. I think that's a really good thing. Mm. Mm. Andrew. Mm. Well, in fact, I'm in my last year of my term as well, so it probably is time for me to start reflecting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I'll save that for, for next year's uh, seminar, webinar. Um, and I, I, I'll confine my commentary to, I think, given the title of today, is about integrity matters. Um, but my views about integrity, and, and I'll just echo well, what the, the other two speakers have just said, and particularly uh, acknowledging the, 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 the potential for the influence and impact of the federal um, anti-corruption commission. I was taken by the work that's being done at the Commonwealth level already on integrity and having a focus on integrity and doing and the integrity risk assessments that will need to be undertaken and are being undertaken and the integrity maturity models. So I think they commend themselves to every jurisdiction and I think we should all be um, taking that lens, that type of lens and applying it to our own organisation, doing an integrity risk assessment within our business uh, at the organisational level, at the program level right down to sometimes the individual procurement transaction level. So I'm optimistic that, that that through osmosis and through sharing of information and knowledge and best practice, that we will lift the game as it goes to integrity. What might um, militate against that? Probably um, we've spoken about tone at the top and you know the leadership is so important, um, but the other reflection I have, is, and we've all experienced, I think, um, all being the jurisdictions over the last few decades is what people talk about is the hollowing out of the public sector, um, the loss of knowledge, skills, experience, um, you know, the, the degradation of capacity and capability. And I think some of that um, can lead to these issues of integrity as much as, you know, inefficient, ineffective service delivery um, because we just don't have those skills retained within the um, the public service. And again, I was heartened by the approaches that are being spoken about at the Commonwealth level about rebuilding the capability and capacity of the public sector and um, using consultants when they should be used, but actually employing full-time public servants in their more traditional roles. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm hoping, I'm optimistic that that would also be a direction that other jurisdictions will take. If Professor Coldrake, who spoke at the APSAC, mm. repeated the really important observations he made in his review that the hollowing out of the public sector has contributed to their lack of influence mm. in directing government the right way, mm. um, it's, it's a really important consideration. Mm. And I would encourage people to read the Coldrake review because there are so many lessons to be learned from it. Thank you. Well, that concludes some of the pre-session questions that we had, and I think we've probably got a little bit of time for a live audience question or two. I'll just see if any are coming through. Okay, um, so we've received some questions um, from smaller organisations across the public sector. 
What are some examples of fraud and corruption prevention for agencies with very limited resources? Can I just start with the culture point? Because you don't need a lot of resource to set the tone that integrity matters. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is simply, you know, you would have the, the tiniest agency, you know, the, the head of that agency, the head of that department uh, makes it very clear that they have a concern that, that, um, that, that these things are important. And it's about, I mean, as, as you describe in your office, Andrew, you, you make sure that you read the confidential declarations, you make it clear that you care about these things, you make, you make it clear that these things are important. You don't need to have a lot of resource to, to set a, a, um, a positive tone. Mm. I, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, the challenge for small organisations, yeah, okay, we're resource challenged. We can't set up separation of duties as we might otherwise wish to, um, which would kind of build some control into the system and help prevent or detect, um, you know, fraud or corruption. But really, um, the tone at the top, it per permeates the organisation. In fact, the smaller the organisation, the easier it is to permeate. Everyone looks up and sees what management does, how they act and behave. And typically in a small organisation, hopefully management's walking the floor. And, you know, so you actually physically experience um, the organisational tone from the top. So I, I think that's probably the response. You know, you, you can't build expensive, costly internal controls. It's got to be about people's attitude and culture. Absolutely. Do you feel the reads harder in a virtual world to do that? There's certainly challenges um, you know, we experience because you know you don't get you don't get to walk the floor. You don't okay. so yeah, I think the, the new world that we're in is quite challenging mm -hmm. in trying to um, um, manifest, if you like, and exhibit the, the attitude of management, but there are other ways to do it. Yeah. And the corollary of that is that where there is fraud or corruption within a small agency. Uh, and though there are lessons to be learned, um, it's much more likely that one can very speedily implement reforms within the organisation that will be effective. Yeah. Okay. Might um, move on to, I think we've probably got time for one or two more. Um, so what advice would you recommend to public servants who have witnessed questionable acts of their superiors and are seeking to involve oversight bodies to investigate potential wrongdoing? Are there particular resources or items um, that we should submit to oversight bodies that will carry out more weight when determining the probability of the case? Well, no, I think there's a really simple answer to that question. Make a disclosure, you know, whether it's to my office or, or, or to IBAC, we assess everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so if it comes to me, we, you know, we will assess if it's a matter we need to, 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 to refer to to I back and, and and we'll ask questions, you know. So so provide whatever evidence you, you you have available to you. If you think that somebody has done something really dodgy, you've got emails or documents that, that would support that, then please provide it. Uh, we'll ask for you know why you think something is is um, is questionable. Mm -hmm. What we're looking for though is does it meet the threshold for improper conduct, you know, and that's that's the test that we're obliged to, to apply, you know, under under the law. And that IBAC, you know, applies when it's considering its its own assessments. So give us whatever you can that to, to support uh, your concern that the conduct is improper. Well, I think it's important to emphasise, of course, that the complaints are confidential. Absolutely. Um, but and protected. But, but IBAC gets a vast number of complaints mm -hmm. per year, maybe five or six thousand or more, and. What's immediately discernible from complaints is if you have someone on the inside who knows what is going on, it becomes very apparent from the content of the complaint. And invariably what will then occur is there'll be follow-up communications and discussion. Um, and of course, always done and mindful of the wishes and whatever limitations the person providing the information wants to impose. Yeah. But um, I don't think it's necessary that the entirety of the, a course of conduct be disclosed in the first no. complaint. No. It's enough that you make clear in the disclosure mm -hmm. that you know what's going on. And I just make the point that we also accept anonymous disclosures, yeah. but it, it is important to recognise that 
we need enough to go on. So, so yeah. sometimes you'll get an anonymous disclosure without the evidence that even allows you to turn over the stones mm -hmm. to determine if there is something there that is capable of investigation. So, so you know, if, if in doubt, you know, or if you're really concerned, make an anonymous disclosure, but provide enough to give us the material to decide if there is something there that, that, that we should be looking at. I guess that's the challenge. I mean, I'll throw a question in because it, it occurs to me, you know, what's your advice to people to, to, if they want to become investigators themselves, you know, will they, do you caution them against, if they've got a sense that there may be some corruption or something out, do you caution them against them trying to do the investigation on their own behalf? to give you the evidence, or would you rather they simply give you the evidence they've come across? Just give us the evidence. Just give us the evidence <laughs> you've come across. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Leave it to the experts yep. to do the investigation. I would have thought that would be the advice. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. I think we may be able to squeeze one more in. Um, so the final question I'll ask today is, what advice would you give someone who would like to work in one of your organisations? <laughs> any pointers for any future candidates? Apply. <laughs> I mean, you know, there, there is, uh, I mean, I, I suspect all, all three of us are in a situation where we are always looking for good people, mm -hmm. uh, particularly yes. investigators. Mm -hmm. uh, so investigative backgrounds come from a, a, a large range of areas you don't need to have. have um, really depends on, on, on the skill set you bring, but um, I, I think we're, we're always looking for yeah. good people with integrity, you know, with public sector values, uh, with skills of, of a wide variety. Yeah. So, yeah. hey, you know, look at our website and if there's a, well, send us your CV. Yeah. No, we are, I agree, we are in real need of valuable people across yeah. the board, whether it's investigators, legal division, intelligence and Analysts, um, administration, call takers, um, complaints um, handlers. We, we are <laughs> desperately in the good people. Yeah. Yes. You know, the idea of that sentiment, and I was talking to Robert before this session, and we we're talking about you know how do you set up an integrity organisation reflecting on the federal um, experience they're just about to go through. And one thing I'm always looking for is diversity. Mm. I think you know it's one of the underpinning concepts I think for any organisation particularly in the integrity frame, is to have diversity. You know, as I said, face diversity and uh, socioeconomic diversity, a whole range of things. So I welcome, we're always continuously recruiting, as, as Roberta would know, um, and we're just looking for people, um, you know, with open and inquiring minds. Um, uh, and analytical ability, of course, is something that we, we look for in people, ability to conceptualise, understand frameworks and apply them. But, um, yeah, just reach out. Um, Okay. And isn't it nice there's only two, not three men? Yeah. Uh, I know, that's, that, that's my worry, you know, and uh, I'm sure this will be corrected over time as well. Yeah. In terms of face diversity, <laughs> at least. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Nick, for the panel. It's been a really thought provoking uh, conversation. I've, I've taken a lot from it, as I um, know that our audience will. And thank you to the audience um, for attending today as well. Um, we do appreciate the time and the valuable insights that you've given all of us today. Um, for the audience, just a reminder, this session will be recorded so you can access it um, post the session. Um, I will make note that we received an abundance of questions from um, the attendees today and we will, as the three collective officers, focus on looking at the content and themes of those questions and to consider them for future sessions on the integrity matters. Um, after the session today, I understand that you'll receive a feedback survey, so we really um, strongly encourage you to provide any feedback um, you, you feel necessary to help us improve the way in which we deliver these sessions. So thank you, everyone, and again, thank you to the panel, and um, take care and have a good afternoon.